And now I'm back with, uh, with Homer Hickam, author of Crater and Rocket Boys. Um, I was wondering if you could tell a us a little bit about uh, the science behind Crater, because this, this book has some, some hard science, it's, it's a hard science world. Yeah, um, everything in Crater is scientifically possible. And uh, even more important, the engineering is correct. Um, for instance, the reason they're there, they're mining helium-3, which I, I've mentioned before that it's an isotope that covers the moon. We found that after Apollo when we were wiping dust off the rocks and somebody said, what's in that dust? And when we looked, we found it was just soaked with helium-3, which is a product of the solar wind, and it is the perfect fuel for a lot of reasons for fusion reactors. So, that, so that's there. But how do you mine it? It's not there. I mean, I went out on the internet and looked. Nobody knows how to mine helium-3. Well, I have, happen to have a background in mining engineering, too. I worked in the coal mines. My daddy was a coal miner. My granddaddy was a coal miner, and so was my great-granddaddy. So I know a little bit about mining, so I figured it out. How are we going to mine helium-3? And that's, that's in there. And Crater is what I call a scragline picker. One of the problems with working on the moon is the dust. Uh, it's not like dust on Earth here. Dust is rather friendly here on Earth. If you look at it under a microscope, it has rounded corners. Up on the moon, there's nothing to erode it down. It's all really jagged stuff. It's nasty stuff. If you go out and look at the Apollo uh, uh, moon suits that they wore that are in the Smithsonian, you'll see they're dirty and nasty. They've tried to get that dust out of there, but they can't. So Crater is a scragline picker. He has to go pick out the dust and the rocks that get clogged up in the machinery there. That's his job. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, about his computer sidekick, Gilly? <laughs> yeah, that turns out to be one of the, probably the favorite character in, uh, in Crater is the Gilly. It's a biological computer. It's made out of slime mold cells. If you'll look up slime mold cells, you'll find that's a very interesting unicellular structure that basically they clump together and they're smart. They can work their way through mazes and uh, they can put like pseudo legs and be able to stand up to try to get to their food and so on. So my idea is that uh, the, the, in the future, the great scientific advance that's probably going to occur is in the biological sciences. And one of them is our computers are no longer going to be made out of plastic and aluminum and silica. Silica, they're going to be made out of some cellular structure, some biological material. And that's what the ghillie is. It's the only one left. They built them. They found out in the first place they were very sneaky. They were always hacking into other computers. They were draining bank accounts for their owner, even when they didn't want them to, to do that. So they made them illegal. But Crater has one because he's an orphan and his parents had one. Mm -hmm. So he's got the only ghillie. I never quite described the ghillie. It's, uh, I want people to use their imagination to imagine what would the ghillie look like. All right. Because that's, that's part of what you get out of a book that you don't get out of a movie, is exactly. you get to fill in the blanks exactly. of things like that. Exactly. I, I was very uh, curious when they made the uh, audio version of Crater, what voice would they give the ghillie? <laughs> and it turned out, the, the guy who did it was, um, was very imaginative. He used, it's sort of a pseudo Stephen Hawking voice. <laughs> and I, and I, I said, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably pretty close. All right, <laughs> all right. I'll tell you that one of, the things, one of the things I enjoyed about this book was your prose in describing what it would be like to live on the moon. Yeah. And what it would be like to grow up and having never seen a plant Mm -hmm. Having never seen a tree or a forest. Or had a pet, no cat, right. no dog. And how would you live on the moon? And, and I also had to go out and figure that out. Now, fortunately, when I worked for NASA, I convinced them to give me a, a little bit of seed money to make a study uh, of what it would re be required in terms of structures uh, to actually live on the moon. I did a 1993 study for them. So I, NASA I had that. It? Yes, Somewhat. and yeah, they had a little extra money they threw it my way. I bought a Macintosh computer with it. Like, okay. then now I've just I've just offended half of your audience. Uh -oh. I'm a Mac guy. I have real work to do. I'm sorry, but anyway, um, the <laughs> just kidding. They're all good. Um, so I already had this in my background, and essentially what you're going to have to do because sometimes you have uh, solar storms, you have influx of radiation. For the most part, you need to live underground or at least have the regolith, the, the dust piled on top of you. Now, it turns out in the last five years, we found out there's a heck of a lot more water on the moon than we ever expected. Right. And that means moon creek. 
Uh, you take those jagged particles of the dust and you mix that with water and, and, and a couple other little chemical reactions and you've got probably the densest material you ever hope to, to have anywhere and you can make what I call tubes. Uh, essentially you're going to live in living tubes. Now this may sound kind of harsh to a lot of folks that here we are you know, in, in 20, 21st century USA. But the fact is that if you were born and raised on the moon, it's going to be like me growing up in Colwood. I thought it was a pretty cool place to live, you know? And the same thing if, you're, if you are born and raised in a town on the moon, you're going to think, this is fine, this is normal, this is okay. They've got observation towers, you can go up. Can you imagine the view of the sky that you would get from the moon? Wouldn't it be incredible? And what would you see hanging over there? You'd see the, that the blue earth. earth hanging there. What a beautiful sight that would be that you don't get from Earth. Mm -hmm. Homer Hickam, thank you. All right, yeah. thank my you. pleasure. Uh, we have more videos on engineering.com from the USA Science and Engineering Festival. I'm Dan Hedges. <laughs>